Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for sticking around and uh, coming to hear about the solar project. My name's Eric Sundquist. I am um, a member of the sustainability ministry team. Several of us are here. Our leader, Pat Egan, is here. Um, Jay Martin, who's been working on the solar project, and Mark Schultz, who has been working on some companion projects around uh, uh, efficiency in our building that are really paying off too, which we'll come to in, in a minute. He deserves a lot of credit for that. Anybody else from the ministry team here? No. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Daniel, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, as many of you know, there's been a desire for years and years to, to do better around our carbon footprint, to do um, solar in particular on our buildings. Um, there was discussion back when I first joined here and this building was being planned, there was discussion that, that didn't, uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, but now we are at a point where we're about to have solar on FUS. And so this is a Q&A about the project and then about how you can get involved in it. This is not a fundraising campaign. It's not an extension of the capital campaign or anything like that. But this project will require some financing. And so I'm, I'll explain how mm -hmm. that works and how you might want to get involved. You can also be involved in the ministry team on um, on other endeavors because we're not going to get to net carbon zero with just this, so we have a lot more to do. So this is also being recorded, so if my droning puts you to sleep, you could go home and, and you know, drink some coffee and watch the rest of it, um, you know, invite your friends, whatever. If somebody says, I wish I'd been able to see it, they can online. And that means if we're gonna, when we do the Q&A, Jay is gonna do Oprah Winfrey with a, with a mic and walk around so that people who are watching online uh, will be able to hear you. So with that, um, I'm gonna have to stand here because I don't have a monitor, sorry about that. So the, the ministry team does have these goals. Um, these aren't exactly, haven't been, you know, blessed by the board or, um, you know, in, written in stone anywhere, but these are sort of our guiding principles and probably not ser terribly controversial. We do want our building and eventually all our operations, we want to talk about transportation, we want to talk about the stuff we buy, anything that we touch to be carbon neutral or better. And or better is, you know, it would be good if we could get better because we put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere over the years that FUS has been around. So to the extent that we can make up for those past years, that would be good. Um, we don't want to blow the budget. I mean, we want this to be hopefully a win-win, things that actually reduce our costs but don't drive them up. And we, we realize that we're relatively small drop in the bucket in Madison or in the world. So whatever we can do that ripples out and affects the community at large and has some multiplier effect, that we're interested in that, not just our own stuff. So to the specifics of the solar project. Last year we had four installers come and give us bids and some of them we went back to twice. So we did a fair amount of due diligence on this and we now have a installer that we've selected. Um, the, the, but just to get you up to speed on why we decided what we did, um, if you sort of were in a, um, I see Kurt up there from our co-op, he's, okay, he'll find us. Um, if you were sort of thinking about this in terms of the economics as they were five years ago, you would tend to be kind of conservative on the size of it because solar panels cost a lot more then. Um, so we got some bids that were in the range of 50 kilowatts. Um, we got one that was much bigger in the 80 kilowatt, it was more aggressive, and we talked to them, and they're the ones we eventually picked. Um, it, it's like the marginal cost of extra panels when you're thinking about all the wiring and labor and inverters and all the other things that are happening is not that much anymore. So you can deal with a little bit of shade or something like that, which, you know, five, ten years ago, you would never do. So we're at a bigger system. And good news is, I mean, it's kind of good and bad. We've, it's taken a while for this to happen. So the bad news is that we don't have it up there yet. Good news is the the improvement in the solar panels has continued, so we're actually gonna get more powerful panels than it was originally spec. So this will be above 80 kilowatts. 
somewhat, maybe 82, 83, not that much. So then the location, we scoured the entire campus for every place that we could put it. There was a parish vote that said, Frank's building is off limits. You can agree or disagree, but that was our boundary. We weren't going to put it on the landmark. Um, but everything else we looked at. We looked at the roofs, we looked at the parking lot, and then the, the grassy grounds. Um, the parking lot has some issues in that people drive in and out of it. It would require a structure. We have snow plowing, additional costs. Um, so there's some issues there. Um, the roof actually has some issues too in that it's not a, just a, a, you know, the optimum sort of south facing sloped roof that you would really love. We have all these sort of weird additions that, you know, face different ways. And then the grounds, the grounds, we have a lot of trees. Um, there might have been some marginal places where we could stick something like on the grounds on the other side of the landmark, but it's a long way from the panel, so running wires over to the panel was not very optimum. So we ended up with just the roof. So that's what we're talking about. I'll show you the, the, what that looks like in just a second. Um, visibility is an interesting thing. We, you know, we have a lot of concern about aesthetics here, and so that's why the original landmark is off limits for this. Um, but we also don't want it to be totally hidden. Or at least that's how we came down. Um, because we do want people to know about it. We want people who come in, do tours here, people who may be here for whatever reason, to know about solar and to actually think about it in their own house or wherever. So we thought that at least some visibility would be useful, but we want to be mindful of the aesthetics. So we're not thinking about putting it on the right building or taking over the green roof or anything uh, like that. So we, it, we opted for partially exposed, which you'll see in a second. Um, so the specs, uh, it's 232 panels. It's going to be greater than now. We didn't, he hasn't fully respect it since we got this um, upgrade in the panels. Um, and it's going to offset about a quarter of our energy use. And I say a quarter, and this is where Mark walks up, but I want to give him props here. You know, the, the energy efficiency stuff is ongoing now, too. Uh, and so we don't know exactly what our energy use is going to be, so we're sort of estimating. But so it's about a quarter of what we were using before the energy efficiency stuff kicked in. And you, you should really give him a pat on the back because um, he's organized a way to run our geothermal pumps more efficiently and take out about another quarter of our usage here. So between these two projects the ministry team's involved in, it's going to take about half of our energy, our electricity use out. So that, that's a really fantastic uh, outcome. And, the, and the, the pumps are kind of not shiny like solar panels. Nobody sees them, and it's kind of boring. But um, I mean, if energy that you don't have to use is even better than energy you have to generate, even if it's sustainable. So. Um, We'll, maybe we'll cheer him when he walks in. Um, we're going to capture all this stuff in a data logger. We're part of our um, commitment to a grantor that is helping us with this is to, again, demonstrate the savings and put it on the web so that people will ripple out and think about doing solar in their own lives. And it's not just here. Um, and all of that is a sticker price of around 170 k for the solar. So when we get to the, and this is what it looks like. You can see that um, there's a, a little bit here on the 2008 building around the green roof, but most of it's on the 60s and 70s era additions that are just over here, the flat roofs that nobody really sees, and some people are just surprised that they even exist over there. They go in those buildings, but they don't really, it's not visible from the parking lot at all. So all that stuff is going to be pretty invisible to anyone unless you go through that passageway that connects, that was part of this edition, and look through that little window, you'll be able to see it there. Um, we will have some right here by the entrance, and that's, that's where the partial visibility comes in. You really won't be able to see these at the top of the green roof unless you really look for it, but right by the entrance right over here, if you kind of peek over it, you'll be able to see it. But it's, so really, I guess, in my opinion, it would be better to have it even more visible, but at least when there's a tour or something, people can point it out and somebody will be able to see it. 
Um, keep, I'll go through all of this and then so that we can run around with the, and, but if somebody has a burning question, we could probably do this, but let me know if you have some, a clarifying question or something, but we can do like, we'll get, get into the weeds a little bit on the financing. That's the hardest thing to deal with, so. Um, but we do want to record it. All right, so if, if we just bought the system outright, um, this is just showing what we would save. If we just owned it today, um, we would save about a quarter of our electric bill. That's about 10,000 a year right now, but um, MG&E is likely to keep ratcheting up costs over time. So, you know, if we, if we assume a reasonable increase in MG&E costs, um, we would be paying something like 2.1 million over the next 30 years to MG&E for electricity. And this project would bring that down to about 1.65, you know, several hundred thousand dollars less than that. So on the face of it, it makes sense. If we had the money, it would be a good thing. We would make a rate of return. We'd be cheaper, we'd lower our cost, our footprint, and so forth. So, but we don't have $170,000, so we have to think about that. Um, again, that's the sticker price. We did go out and get a grant from Renew Wisconsin called Solar for Good that's available to congregations. Um, so that's good. It's going to lower our price by 20000 Focus on Energy has a couple of programs for renewable um, installations. We tried for the big one. Actually, we tried twice. Um, and we asked for something like twenty to 30000 and we did not get that. But there is a prescriptive grant of around 4,000 that we should be able to get when we install this. So that brings it down, um, uh, you know, to the 150 range. Um, the capital campaign that concluded last year set aside some money for this, 35,000. But there were that money is still coming in from pledges, so they don't have that in the bank yet. Um, but there is a commitment of 35K. So now, if we waited for that 35 and we used these others, you know, we were down to like 120 or something like that. Still a big gap. So our options would be to delay the project, and if we relied on the 35, we'd have to delay it. Um, that would then be a problem for this grant. It has a deadline. Make it smaller, get a loan, um, or go back out and do some more fundraising. But we just, you know, we just did that. So none of those were particularly appealing. So instead, we're working with Legacy Solar Co-op and Kurt Reinhold, who is the, the genius behind that, is here today to help us with uh, some of the nitty gritty questions um, should they come up. Um, I've been involved with the co-op now for about four years on another project, so I can speak to the legitimacy and how it, how it all works. It is a little convoluted though, so um, buckle up. And it's not convoluted because Kurt made it intentionally complicated. It's convoluted because we have to deal with Public Service Commission and statutes in Wisconsin about what constitutes a utility and what doesn't. So we have to make sure we aren't a utility. Um, and we have to work, as you'll see in a second, we have to deal with um, federal rules on getting tax credits. So the whole point of working with the Legacy Solar Co-op is to, to um, one, come up with this upfront cash to, to build the system, but two, to um, engage a profit-making entity that will be able to de get tax benefits, lowering the overall cost. So that 150,000 that we're not covering with our grants um, is going to be covered through working with the, the co-op. Um, and again, this gets a little complicated, so bear with me and there'll be questions. So what, with Kurt and the co-op's help, an individual with some tax liability will set up an LLC. This will be a profit-making entity only for the purpose of developing the, the project here. They'll get revenues as we pay for our energy services over the years. So it is a legitimate profit-making entity. Um, you know, it's not something that somebody's going to make billions on, but it, they will get a return on it. Um, so that we're in the per we're in the in the uh, process of setting that up now. What it requires is somebody that we're calling a tax sponsor. 
They will set up the LLC. It'll be called FUS Solar LLC or something like that. And if anybody's interested in doing that, we already have a couple people who put up their hands to do it, but nobody's signed on the bottom line yet. Uh, it requires that you have a certain amount of tax liability, maybe 15000 a year, because you have to be able to take the tax credit off of that to make this all work, and be able to put in um, maybe 30 40% of the upfront capital of the project up front. So if, you're, if that sounds like you, if you're flush enough to, to do those things, um, we'd be interested in talking to you. And even if you didn't do it for FUS, the co-op has a bunch of other projects with nonprofits and churches going on, and it might be, you might want to do that. Um, so the LLC then, where does the LLC get its money? Um, it gets an upfront tax credit of 30% of the, of, is it the cost of the system or the cost of the LLC, what the LLC puts in? to the LLC, okay. So it wouldn't be 30% of the entire system cost because we have this grant to make it, to cover part of it, but it'll be 30% of the, the 150-ish, 150K or so. Um, and then you're able as an LLC to then write off the depreciation on the capital asset over a period of years. That is a very significant amount too. So it ends up being about half of the cost of whatever the LLC puts in between depreciation and the tax credit. So, that, so if it's 150, we're getting 75 back from Uncle Sam, basically, to reduce the cost of this, is the way that works. Um, so then the LLC, the owner of the LLC, will put in some money to capitalize it. The way other people can get involved is through buying bonds. The, the co-op, most of its, um, I don't know, I think most of its day-to-day uh, -day activity is around these bonds. It raises money through bonds and then makes loans to all the LLCs that have been created. So you won't be buying a bond in the FUS project per se, you'll be buying a bond in the co-op, which will make a loan to the LLC. See, I told you this gets complicated, but if you, once you get your head around it, it's like it kind of, it all works, it's just complicated. Um, the bonds are 12-year um, bonds. They pay 4 to 6%, depending on how much you buy. The more you buy, the more interest you earn, just because the transaction costs are less at the co-op level. Um, you have to be a co-op member. You can be a co-op member for as little as 25 bucks if you want to just do it as a one-time deal. If you want to be a lifetime member, I think it's 100, and then you could buy bonds for the rest of your life. Um, in different projects, you know, in, in help capitalize these projects on and on. Um, an advantage to having our members buy the bonds is that five years from now, six, seven years from now, maybe you're made whole, you've gotten back all your principal and you're feeling generous, you could, you could donate the remaining equity in the bond and even though it's not a, a bond in the first Unitarian project, it could be it could end up as equity in our system. So uh, help us own the system sooner. But it, it doesn't have to be members of our congregation to buy these bonds, and, it, and they all get mixed together. So there will be funds that bond, bond owners from here, here and there, they have to be Wisconsin residents, but it'll all get mixed together and be in this loan to the LLC. So then, FUS, we turn this on, say, in July, which is about what we're looking at. Um, the um, LLC will invoice FUS for the energy services, and we, which will offset what would have been paid to MG&E. Um, and it's set at a rate so that we actually have a little benefit to FUS up front. FUS will pay a little bit less for this energy than it would be to MG&E. Uh, not a lot, but a little bit. So it's a little cash benefit up front. When the system is owned by FUS, of course, then that chart that we showed before kicks in and you, you know, it's, all, it's all gravy. Um, so this goes on for a period of years. It has to go on at least about six years in order to satisfy the IRS and to get all the depreciation benefits and so forth. Between year six and 12, we can talk about buying out the rest of the bonds or the rest of the equity that we don't have not, um, and taking it over. And that could happen in year seven, it could happen in 10, 12. 
Um, so as long as we don't do that, we'll be paying these invoices. The sooner we do it, you know, the better, but we'd still have to come up with some money to do that. So this is kind of what it looks like if we assume that we didn't, um, we let it go the full 12 years. You can see, you know, about $1,000 or a little less of benefit per year in the years that we're paying the LLC. And then once we take ownership, we're up around 12,000, assuming this increase in MG&E rates by then. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in good shape. Um, so the total over 25 years would be a $200,000 savings if, if it works out this way. If we take it over sooner, it'll be a little bit better. Um, if MG&E doesn't raise its rates as much, then it'll be a little less, but this is a, an estimate. So there's a little issue that came up as we were thinking about this last fall. It turns out that the flat roofs over here are leaking. And um, it's probably not a good idea to put you know, new solar array on roofs that are at the end of their life and have to be replaced. So we could have probably limped along and patched them for a few more years, but eventually they were going to have to, I mean, pretty soon they were going to have to be replaced anyway. So that project is going to start on this week, weather permitting. Um, it's not a cheap project. It involves getting a crane and lifting stuff over, and so it's over $100,000. It's, um, there was a, a well-timed bequest. I don't know whose it, who's it was, but there was a bequest that's going to cover a fair amount of this. The FUS Foundation has been approached to cover some of it, and then the remaining roughly $50,000 is going to be bundled into the LLC. So the LLC will also take that on. What that'll do is uh, allow us to pay back that portion of the roof in these quarterly billings for energy. It'll eat into, if not offset, that little gain that I was showing over the first 12 years. So we might actually be at a deficit, but that's because we're paying for a roof. The energy will be at a, you know, a profit, quote unquote, for FUS from day one. But with this roof added in, um, you know, you've got to pay, got to pay for that. So. Um, the a benefit of having it in the LLC is not only that it'll provide this upfront capital, but some of that can also be put into the tax credit and depreciation as well. Um, so it reduces the cost of our roof a little bit and lets us pay it off in a, in a way that is more amenable than just coughing up 110000 Oops, wrong way. So here's the summary of uh, what's going to, the outcomes here, and I'm almost done droning on. We're going to reduce our carbon footprint substantially, but not entirely. So the ministry team is going to keep working on the rest of it. Um, utility costs, again, absent the roof. So these are not with the roof. $900 a year or so to begin with, and then um, 200000 as you saw, over 25 years. Um, we'll have this out in the community. Hopefully, it will generate more interest in renewables and more activity um, generally. Uh, the roof is coming at significant savings, and people can invest. In, normally, to invest in some new enterprise, you have to be like a, a billionaire or something. You have to, to do an IPO or something that's generating new activity in the world. It's really hard to do that. Usually, you go to the stock market and buy some stock that's been traded 85 times since it was initially offered or, or something. This, these bonds will directly influence what more uh, development of solar in our area. So it's really pretty exciting that somebody with 250 bucks can be catalyzing something like that. At least I think so. Um, so here's the timeline. Um, the roofing project is starting this week. If it doesn't rain too much, um, it's supposed to take about two weeks. Um, the LLC, as I said, we're looking for a tax sponsor to go ahead and um, pull the trigger on that. Um, the, the bonds are available now, and Kurt can speak to that about how you could purchase them. You can do them online for up to 1,000, so that's easy. Um, if you want to do more than 1,000, then it involves a conversation, right? It's just, yeah, Ah, that's the reason, okay. 
But you could, could you take bond orders today or not? Okay. Okay. So either that or, or online and fill out the form and do, you can buy four $250 bonds online, but more than that, you need to, you, it's a check and not a credit card, I guess, huh? Okay, so midsummer after the roof is done, um, our installer, and by the way, the installer is full spectrum. Um, they're on East Washington. They're the ones who had the most creative um, proposal, and when we, um, you know, it was the one that was most aggressive and, and best thought out. When we pushed the other um, installers on, can you match this or what do you think about it? A couple of them said, oh, well, that's a good idea. We'll just do that. And others uh, were non-responsive. So we were really impressed with the amount of upfront time that Full Spectrum put into this and the creativity. So we're... It, and, and they have a long track record here, so a lot of people are familiar with them. So that's who we're going with. Um, so solar production begins as soon as that's done. Um, the other part besides the array will be an inverter, which will just hang off the back of um, where the, the utility room is over here. If you're walking back to the classrooms, there's a door, and it'll be hanging off the back of that and wired into the panel. You, nobody will ever see it, but it'll be back there. Um, so then six to 12 years, we'll be paying the LLC for our um, utility services rendered. And at some point, we'll take it over and own it and you know, we'll just be generating our own power. By then, maybe we will have added something in the parking lot or some other thing, but um, at least this system will then be ours. Um, and again, our ministry team will be thinking about ways to get to net carbon zero or better um, through offsets or other, other opportunities too. So if you're interested in the ministry team, you can always look us up for that. And so that's all I had. Mark, you walked out just as I was like praising you to the heavens here about your EE work. So um, I, this again, just a fantastic, um, you know, under the radar project that's gonna really help us, so. Okay, so that's what I had. Um, we could take questions if people have them. Or Kurt, did you want to come up and say anything more first? Why don't you come up here and use the mic because we're being uh, we're on the web. And Jay's going to Oprah Winfrey it in case so we can capture that. <laughs> did you want to say anything first? Sure. Hi. Thanks for uh, letting me speak, Eric and all of you. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be part of a project that is kind of a long time in the making and we'll, we'll see how quickly and efficiently we move forward from here, but there's always a lot of questions because uh, with this funding program, it's fairly complex, but it's, uh, it's, it's elegant, I'll say, in its complexity um, because it does uh, multiple uh, things to make, number one, the uh, value of this proposition much better for uh, FUS, but also you get to have some participants make a little bit of a return on their investment in the meantime. Um, and it, uh, you know, just reduces some of the barriers and, and increases access to investing in, in this kind of clean energy, uh, kind of putting your, your money where your mouth is sort of thing. So uh, I've been at this uh, quite a few years. In fact, uh, Eric was on an advisory committee I had back in, I think, um, 08 or 09, um, when I was working on a, uh, a grant to do uh, um, uh, do work in this area, basically, which is to in investigate uh, remedies for some of the barriers that exist in this community solar uh, uh, model. And in Wisconsin, we have some unique uh, barriers, but there are some that are that are federal, like the uh, rules surrounding tax credits, uh, as well as rules surrounding 
the offering of an investment uh, in a public manner uh, that uh, could be classified as a security. So there, there are lots of, uh, lots of reasons why uh, we had to make it a complex funding instrument, uh, but after having um, done all of the hard work and planning, uh, we've been successful with over 20 uh, solar projects in Wisconsin. Uh, they're all nonprofits of one kind or another. In fact, some of them are not nonprofits. Some of them are, are farms uh, or cooperatives, which uh, some people think are the same thing as nonprofits, but they're not. Uh, it's just uh, how you how you handle the uh, the accounting and the and the uh, uh, surplus revenue. So we've we've worked with a number of houses of faith, and so I could uh, answer some of your questions perhaps through uh, uh, you know discussing how we've uh, addressed that issue uh, with with some of these these solar projects. Uh, so maybe I'll just leave it there. Actually, one other thing I wanted to say is that our, our program has evolved over the years. And one of the ways that it's evolved is in the, the form of the co-op bonds. I don't know if any of you have ever um, uh, thought about or actually did invest in co-op bonds with, for instance, the uh, Willie Street Co-op when they were doing their their fund drive to raise capital for the West store and then also for the North store. So I've been involved with um, not only the Willie Street Co-op, but uh, the um, uh, Regent Market Co-op uh, bond drives for some of the capital improvements. And so we basically modeled our, our bond fundraising model uh, after those. Uh, but we made some improvements, I think, at least, you know, considering what the application of, of that, uh, that co-op tool um, is being used for. Um, so here, um, Eric mentioned bond members can earn between 4 and 6%. We've actually changed it a little bit. Now you can decide if you want to, you, could, you don't have to necessarily receive 4% or 5% or 6%. You could say, you know what, I just want to do a cash neutral transaction uh, or I just want 2% return. You know, so it's, it, you can write in there, you know, what your expectation is and what, your, what you would like to see. And any difference between our cost of doing business and whatever your interest rate is, that just help, helps empower and uh, provide more um, margin for, for allowing us to extend this opportunity to other parishes, other, uh, other solar projects. Um, but the other thing I would say is that even if you are considering um, the, the smallest bond uh, allocation of, of $250, you can actually earn 6%. So you can earn the highest uh, if you are planning to uh, donate at least half of that to the FUS uh, at the end of the, 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 the six-year term or anywhere between years one and 12. They're 12-year they're, they're bonds, but in year six, FUS has the option to buy you out in order to, uh, you know, get a bigger lion's share of the energy savings going forward after year six. But if you have to wait all the way to year 12, and then, um, you know, now you're paid back. But in year six, you still have about two-thirds or three-quarters of your principal is still out there. And at $250, that would end up being about 150 if you were to agree to donate that $150 to FUS um, for those first six years, we'll pay you. We'll pay you six percent. So it's just a, it's just kind of an incentive that we're adding in there to provide um, kind of a goodwill gesture 
if you're, if you're thinking of, in those terms of, of helping, um, helping FUS with, with this project. Excellent. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. Question. My name is Mr. Knapp Cordes. I have two things I'm confused about. The first is, um, have you found a tax sponsor for this project? And the second thing is, how much, how many bonds do we have to buy? I know it's a community in total, but uh -oh. what are you looking for in terms of the amount of bonds? Oh, no, okay, so I'll restate the question just in case um, it wasn't picked up. I, I heard it, I think. Um, thank you for asking that. It's somewhere between uh, zero bonds, well, not really. I mean, uh, I'm gonna give you the extreme. Um, a tax sponsor can fund the entire project, him or herself, if, if they wanted to, but it allows um, having a, a loan from the co-op or having a second source of funding besides just the tax sponsor allows the uh, FUS and or the co-op and other participants in the co-op to, to be the off taker of this uh, project in, after six years. And so it could be 50-50 so if we had a $150,000 project, and let's say the tax sponsor put in 50,000 of his or her own funding, and, we, and, and that person leveraged another $75,000. Well, that means that for $75,000, that would be the same as um, divided by 250 is 300 bonds or 3,000 bonds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So 75K worth of bonds. Right, 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 right. So, so that's the answer to your second question. The, first, the answer to your first question, uh, do we have a tax sponsor yet for this project? We don't have a fully vetted and accepted tax sponsor relationship yet, um, but we will uh, hopefully uh, soon. Um, so I'm sorry I can't be de definite with that answer. But if people are interested, you have other projects, right? Absolutely, yeah. So we, there's other opportunities. Other if this sounds good and, and FUS is taken, because there are, is, are at least one or two people who are already interested, um, then, you know, the next, how many do you have in the pipeline? Half a dozen? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there'll be for folks looking for, for this year. Uh, and this individual was a tax sponsor just a few years back, right. and so, um, uh, you know, we have a model that he can speak to, and, and then there, I, you know, I can provide uh, additional references from other parishes or other houses of faith where we've done the similar model. Variations on it, but um, it's proved pretty successful. Uh, we had a library that had a number of trustees, you know, buy bonds themselves, and then the, um, the foundation purchased about half of the other bonds. So it was a nice mix between, uh, you know, we had about a dozen people who bought, you know, small amounts, maybe 250 or $1,000 or 2,000. We had one couple buy $6,000 worth of bonds. We had a corporate sponsor that brought in 15,000 and then the, uh, the Library Foundation purchased uh, about $20,000 worth of bonds. So it was really a, a very colorful mix of, peop of, of folks who came together for, for that library. And, um, you know, so that, that's probably the average is maybe, you know, we have a, maybe a dozen participants uh, with one tax sponsor and it just helps to, to level the, the playing field uh, financially. Uh, with with those other uh, potential uh, solar hosts uh, who who happen to pay taxes and can actually uh, use a tax credit to, to help fund it, so that we have to jump through hoops uh, and legitimately so it's kind of like the low income housing tax credit uh, where you 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 have some you have some private equity that you bring in to do a public good and you have a lot of strings attached with that tax credit but it allows some good to, to take place um, and to, 
to you know reduce the long-term cost of, of that project so thank you any other questions I was wondering if your projections uh, over the next 30 years include any well, how the maintenance of that system is included in that or if there's any kind of warranty on the panels themselves so the, the panels are warranted for 25 years um, we, we, they'll be insured so you know they're, they're usually as good as a roof is for hail if there was a really bad hailstorm that would destroy your roof it might damage these as well but you know they're not fragile um, after 25 years and, and those warranties do get called on. The project that Kurt alluded to that I did on housing initiatives, we had a warranty issue, and Full Spectrum went out and replaced it, and it was like, there was no, that's one reason we want to have the data logger, so we can see, is there anything, anything weird? Is it the production low this month for some reason? Then we get it fixed right away. Um, maintenance, the, pro, the most likely item of maintenance is the inverter, because those, kind of go bad after, I don't know, 12 years or, I don't know, yeah. something yeah, like the, that. The warranty period on inverters varies, but um, usually it's a 12, 10 to 12 year warranty. You can, ex you can buy an extension up to 20 years, but you know, then maybe it costs the same if you buy one or two extra inverters and keep them in the closet until you need them. Um, but we do factor in kind of this discount rate over tw 20 years of, of what it would cost each year and then you know you kind of levelize that cost and so we kind of build that into the pro forma yeah so not much maintenance um especially since we're doing the roof now so we didn't have to mess with the roof again anybody got anything else well great well, thanks again for coming. I saw Joe came in um, as we were starting to talk. I want to give him um, props also because both the board and um, the executive director, Monica Nolan, have worked through this. There have been um, ups and downs. We thought when you know, we realized the roof would have to be replaced as part of this, not only did was Kurt creative in thinking about how the LLC and the, and this, the bonds and everything would help on that, but so was your executive director and board, and they worked through it, including making an ask of the foundation to make, you know, to fill a little gap. So, um, it, you know, so my ask to you is um, give them all credit and thank them for working hard on this in their volunteer and paid positions. Um, if you want to do a tax sponsorship on this or something else, talk to Kurt or email him. Um, LegacySolarCoop.org is the website. Easy to find in Google. Um, and if you want to do bonds, you can also do up to 1,000 online there. I didn't realize about the 6% the bonus for donations and all that kind of stuff. So, but you can find the bond disclosure and everything you need to buy bonds online too, or, or I guess talk to Kurt right today before we leave. And then look for some activity on the roofs up here in the next few months. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate thanks, Kurt. It. Finally getting there. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. On the things I can hand out. Good. Things.